Hey, STAT students, how you doing? Time for another STATS video. This one is on the introduction to hypothesis testing, in particular, hypothesis testing of proportions, okay? Now, the best way to talk about hypothesis testing is to just jump right in and show an example. So let's do exactly that, all right? Here's our example. A newspaper cites a 30-year-old statistic claiming that 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education. You think, hmm, 85%? seems kind of low. I think these days that's actually going to be higher, okay? So you think the proportion may be higher today, so you take a random sample of 120 adults in their 20s. Okay, so what are you doing here? You're taking a random sample, you're going to measure the proportion of those people that have at least a high school education. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking a sample proportion, okay? We know about sample proportions, we're just looking at them. We're looking at the distribution of them when we're looking at our, sam at our sampling distributions. Okay, so yeah, this is, this is old hat. We know how to do this. But we also know the first thing we need to do is check our conditions. And so, first off, randomization. Yes, it says they were random, so good. All right, secondly, independence. Well, a sample of size 160 is way less than 10% of all people in their 20s. So uh, that's, that's not going to be a problem. And in addition, it's fairly reasonable to think one person's educational attainment is not going to affect another person's ed educational attainment, especially if the sample was randomly chosen. And, uh, and then finally, is n big enough? Well, let's see. In this case, n is 160, uh, p is 0.85, so if I multiply n times p, I get 136. If I multiply n times q, q being 1 minus p, I get uh, 24, both greater than 10. That means we can uh, use the normal model. Uh, to, uh, to, to model our p hat. Okay, cool. Well, now let's look at what the distribution of p hat will look like. Well, uh, we have n equals 160. According to the paper, according to the paper, again, I'm not sure this is true, but this is what the paper says. Uh, p equals 0.85, so the expected value of our p hat is going to be 0.85. The standard deviation of our p hat is going to be p times q over n, take the square root of that, and you get about 2.8%, okay? So that means the distribution of p hat is gonna look something like this, okay? Where it's gonna be centered at 0.85, uh, there's a, 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 a about a two-thirds chance, 68% chance, that my sample proportion will be somewhere between 82.2% and 87.8%. Uh, and it's virtually assured, you know, 99.7% uh, chance that it'll be between 76.5 and 93.5%. Uh, okay, so there you go. That's, that's what my uh, 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 p hat distribution should look like. Now, what do we actually get? What we get is 146 people saying they have at least a high school education. Let's see, 146 uh, out of uh, 160 is 91.25%. Uh, Ooh, that's pretty high, okay? As a matter of fact, 91.25%, that would be uh, right, uh, right there, okay? Uh, and uh, the z-score of that p-hat is going to be 2.214, which makes sense because this is a little more than uh, two standard deviations above the mean. Our experience is that's fairly unusual. Matter of fact, this little red area here telling us the probability of getting that sample proportion or something higher, that's only 1.3%. So, hmm there's only a 1.3% chance that I would get a sample statistic that high or higher uh, given this model. So how do I react? Do I say, wow, I got a really weird sample? Or do I say, I don't think that sample was necessarily that weird. I think there's something messed up with my model. This is exactly what hypothesis testing is, okay? Because what I'm testing is the model, okay? I'm testing my initial hypothesis. So let's look in particular at the steps to hypothesis testing. Number one, you get a hypothesis, okay? And you call it the null hypothesis. That's the hypothesis, that's the hypothesis you're starting from. Here my null hypothesis was 85% of uh, people in their 20s have at least a high school education, okay? Then you get your alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is the, think you, the thing you think is actually true. Okay? You're not really sure about this null hypothesis and you think, nah, there's an alternative hypothesis. 
the alternative hypothesis is always stated as an inequality. Okay? You look at this null hypothesis, which is stated as, as an equality, and you say, nah, it's too high, or it's too low, or simply, it's wrong. Okay? But you never state the alternative hypothesis as an equality, as, as an equality. Okay? Uh, then, what do you do? You, got, you, take a, uh, you take a sample, all right? You gather a bunch of data, and you see, hmm, what do, what do the data say? Do they support the null hypothesis? Are they kind of consistent with the null hypothesis? Or are they way off in the end somewhere? And then after that, you say, well, if they're not consistent, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. And uh, otherwise, if they're, you know, fairly consistent, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? It's important to note, the only two possible outcomes are reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? You don't accept the null hypothesis. You either reject it or you fail to reject it. One way to think about this is you think, think that you're a prosecuting attorney and this is a trial. Okay? The null hypothesis is the defendant saying he's innocent. All right? You, you have an alternative hypothesis there. You don't think the, the, the defendant is innocent. But according to the trial, you're supposed to assume that the, that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. Okay? And how do you prove that the person's guilty? You prove beyond a reasonable doubt. What's a reasonable doubt? Mm, I don't know. Okay? That's, that, that's kind of up to, the, uh, it's up to the members of the jury. Same thing here. We looked at, the, uh, uh, we looked at our, uh, uh, our situation. We saw that there was only a 1.3% chance of getting a sample statistic that high. So then we have to say, hmm, is that reasonable or is that unreasonable? Uh, if it's reasonable, then I fail to reject the null hypothesis. I find the defendant innocent. Or well, I find the defendant not guilty. Okay? Just like failing to reject. If I think it's unreasonable, okay, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, then I say, no, I'm rejecting the null hypothesis. I find the defendant guilty. Okay? All right. So, uh... Let's look at, this, uh, at, at these, uh, these, these particular things in the context of our problem here. The null hypothesis here is that 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high, high school education. And the way that we write that is this. This is H with a little zero subscript. Okay, That's the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that P equals 0.85. Please note, the null hypothesis is not that P hat equals 0.85. It's that P equals 0.85. What we're testing here is the population proportion, not the sample proportion. We'll get a sample proportion. We'll see exactly what it is. But we'll want to test and see if this makes sense with the population pr proportion being 0.85. Okay? The alternative hypothesis in our case is more than 85% of adults in their 20s have at least a high school education. So P is greater than 0.85. Okay? We test our conditions, we go through our mechanics, we find out that there is a 1.3% chance of getting something that big, and that is our p-value, okay? The p-value, this is a new thing for us, the p-value is the probability of getting data as extreme as we got, assuming the null hypothesis is true, okay? A lot of people misinterpret uh, the p-value, and they'll say, oh, it's the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Uh -uh. The null hypothesis is not a random variable. Okay, So don't associate probabilities with something that's not a random variable. The random variable is p-hat. Okay, It's random because it depends on the particular sample that we happen to be choosing. Okay, So it's going to vary from sample to sample to sample. And that's what makes it a random variable. Okay, So the probability of, of us getting uh, a, a value of p hat that's as, ex as extreme as we got was only 1.3%. That's what our p value is. Okay? It's a conditional probability, is what it is. Because we're, we're saying the probability of getting something this high with the condition, okay, assuming that our null hypothesis is true. Okay? And then, uh, <clears throat> and then finally, we, we have a conclusion. Okay? And uh, our conclusion has to make sense. Generally, I state the conclusion using two sentences. The first sentence says, because there is only a 1.34% chan uh, chance of getting a sample proportion this high, according to the null hypothesis, 
I reject the null hypothesis, okay? So first sentence, you state. Whether you're rejecting the null hypothesis or failing to reject the null hypothesis, you state your p-value and you state what it means, okay? In the second sentence, what you say is, there is significant statistical evidence that the actual proportion of adults in their 20s with at least a high school education is greater than 85%, okay? So state it in the context of the problem itself. And the fact is, if your p-value is really low, you're gonna reject the null hypothesis. That means you do have st significant statistical evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true, okay? If the p-value is not particularly low and you fail to reject the null hypothesis, then you really don't have evidence of anything. You don't have evidence that the null hypothesis is true. The fact is, you simply don't have evidence of really anything. Okay? All right, so, <clears throat> things to note. Number one, the null hypothesis is always stated as an, an, as an equality. I noted that earlier, not an inequality. Uh, and you must assume that it's true until you have evidence that it's not, basically until you reject it, okay? Uh, by the way, you may be thinking, well, if it's not true, then, then, then what is? What is P? Okay? We'll get to that. Matter of fact, next video, we'll get to get, uh, making an estimate, estimate of P. Okay? The alternative hypothesis is always stated as an inequality. I mentioned that earlier as well. Okay? And the alternative hypothesis, that's the thing that we really believe. Okay? Uh, like I said, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. You assume the null hypothesis is true. The p-value is the probability of you getting data that looks like what you got or even more extreme, okay? And uh, always remember, if the p-value is low, you reject the null hypothesis, okay? Otherwise, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, and those are your only two options, okay? So, oh, hey, uh, if you decide to reject the null hypothesis, you do have statistically significant evidence. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is sometimes referred to as a significance test. Hypothesis test, significance test, exact same thing, okay? So you have statistically significant evidence of the alternative hypothesis. If you, failed, if you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you don't have evidence of, any, of anything. Because, again, think about this as uh, you're, you're the prosecuting attorney. If you don't make your case, you don't shrug and go, wow, I guess he was innocent after all. No, you look at the, at, the, at the defendant and you go, oh man, he's guilty, I just didn't do my job. I just failed to convict, okay? That's what happens here. I failed to reject. Probably what you do if you fail to reject is you run out and you get more data, okay? All right, uh, let's, uh, oh, hey, I thought we were going to another uh, example, but instead, let's talk about what alpha is, okay? Alpha. Uh, that's alpha right there. It's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and it is also the point at which your p-value is not believable. Okay, so think about this. We got a p-value of 1.3 percent, and we said, "Man, that's just too low. That's too weird." If we got a p-value of say 30 percent, we'd say that happens all the time. Okay, we we would get a, a, a p-value that that's that's that high. Uh, one out of every three times. That's not all that unusual at all. Okay, somewhere between 30% and 1.3%, we crossed a line. We crossed a line that went from, yeah, I could believe that, to, nah, I don't believe that. That's alpha, okay? It's the point at which you stop believing that uh, that null hypothesis is true, that you reject the null hypothesis, okay? It's subjective. It depends on you. It depends on you, the researcher, and it also depends on the context that you're working in. Uh, if you're doing something that, where you wouldn't really have many negative uh, consequences to be wrong, you might have kind of a high alpha, okay? Uh, as, uh, and on the other hand, if you're uh, accusing a bunch of lawyers of lying, uh, then they might kind of come after you if you're wrong. So you might want a really, really low alpha there, okay? It really depends on... Uh, on the context, okay? What else is alpha? Alpha is known as the significance level of the test, okay? It's also the probability, assuming that the null hypothesis actually is true, that you goof up, that you mistakenly reject the null hypothesis. Because think about it, 
What this, what this is, is the probability that you actually did get a weird batch, okay? You're not saying, you're not saying, oh, I got a weird sample. You're saying, the sample is so weird that I'm throwing away the whole model. But this says, uh, alpha is the probability that, no, uh, uh, it was actually okay, and uh, you just got a weird sample. Uh, and then alpha is also your tolerance for being wrong. If you use an alpha of, let's say, 1%, then what that means is, you can expect to be wrong 1% of the time. And you'll be right 99% of the time, okay? If your alpha is 20%, then people are gonna stop taking you very seriously because one out of every five times, you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna state something that's just completely wrong. Okay, uh, time to look at another uh, example here. Harper's Index reports that 80% of all supermarket prices end in the digit nine or five. Think about it. You go to the supermarket and you look at how much something costs. Really frequently, that last digit there is a nine or a five. Okay? But you're thinking to yourself, I don't know, 80%? That's high. I think it's lower than that. Okay? <laughs> so you check a random sample of 115 items in the supermarket and you find that 84 have prices that end in nine or five. So, question is, does this indicate that less than 80% of the prices in the store end in the digit nine or five? Okay, so basically, is this statistically significant evidence that less than 80% of the prices in the store end in the digit nine or five? Okay, so first off, let's, let's define what our hypotheses will be. Sometimes it's actually easier to start with the alternative hypothesis than it is to start with the null hypothesis, because look, the alternative hypothesis is staring us in the face. Less than 80%. So our alternative hypothesis is gonna be that P is less than 80%. What does that mean our null hypothesis is? P is 80%, okay? So null hypothesis is P is gonna be 80% or 0.8, where P is the proportion of super, supermarket items with prices ending in nine or five, and like I said, the alternative hypothesis is gonna be that P is less than 0.8, okay? And technically, at this point, you really should choose your alpha, okay? And so let's say, Alpha is going to be 5%, okay? 5% is actually an extremely common choice for alpha. I'm not saying you should use 5%. I'm saying if you do use 5%, you will not be unusual, okay? Uh, now, the reason I'm saying you should choose your, your alpha at the beginning, if you're doing this with integrity, okay? If you're doing this uh, as ethically as possible, then before you even look at your data, you should say, okay, what's... What's going to convince me that I should reject the null hypothesis? And you just think about it, okay? Give it some thought. And uh, it shouldn't be that hard to come up with a significance level. And once you come up with a significance level, then it's, the rest of it is really, really easy. Because what this means is, if my p-value is less than 5%, I reject the null hypothesis. If my p-value is greater than 5%, I fail to reject my null hypothesis. I don't have to think about it anymore. I've done the thinking already, okay? So uh, we look at our conditions. It's, uh, it's a random sample, good. Uh, uh, 115 items is way less than 10% of all supermarket items, even if it's just in, in, a, in one supermarket. Uh, is my sample big enough? Is 115 big enough? Well, 80% of 115 is 92, and 20% of 115 is 23, so we're good. They're both bigger than 10. All right, so we're good to go. Let's continue here. Uh, there's what we have, and according to our null hypothesis, the expected value p hat is going to be p, 0.8. The standard deviation of p hat is going to be p times q over 115. The square root of that is, uh, so about 3.7%, okay? That's what uh, p hat's going to look like, all right? Now, what do we see from our sample? We got 84 items uh, with prices ending in 9 or 5. That's actually 73%. So the z-score for that is uh, our observed value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation gets us negative 1.865. And uh, let's see, that's, uh, that's the, 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 the p-value, that is the probability that z would be as low as negative, eight, uh, negative 1.865 or even lower. That's 3.1%. What was my alpha again? My alpha was 5%. That means reject. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay? I got what I wanted. I got to reject the null hypothesis because my p value is less than my alpha. Okay? And then what do I say? I say 
because there is only a 3.1% chance of getting a sample proportion this low according to the null hypothesis. I reject the null hypothesis. There is significant statistical evidence that the actual proportion of supermarket items with prices ending in 9 or 5 is less than 80%. I realize this is kind of wordy. Do it anyway, okay? And by the way, if you're not very good at coming up with your own uh, sentence, then please pause the video right now, copy this down, and then after that, copy it down again, but put little blanks where the p-value is or where the null hypothesis is. Okay, just put it in the skeleton so that you can just fill in blanks later on. You'll thank me, okay? It makes it really, really easy. Uh, here's our next uh, 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 example. An article on the internet claims that 40% of all those who take the driver's test in Texas pass on the first try. By the way, made this up, okay? Don't think this is real. Uh, you suspect the author of the article, <laughs> ironically, made this up, and you decide to test this at a 5% significance level. So that's our alpha, 5%. You take a cluster sample, recording all the data from five randomly selected locations throughout the state for a day. You find that out of 184 drivers, 62 of them pass on the first try. Is this evidence that the proportion of drivers that pass, on their, pass their test on the first try is not 40%? Now, what's different about this one. What's different about this one is my alternative hypothesis isn't, oh, I think it's more than 40% or, oh, I think it's less than 40%. My alternative hypo hypothesis is it's not 40%. It's just something else. Uh-huh. Okay? This is what's known as a two-tailed test, and you'll see why in just a second. Okay? So our null hypothesis is that P is 0.4, where P is the proportion of those who pass on the first try. My alternative hypothesis is it's not. Okay? And uh, this is what this means. This is why it's a two-tailed test. It means if I get a P hat that is way up here, I'll reject it. Okay? Because it's, it's, it, it, it's not consistent with uh, my hypothesis of P being 0.4. But if I get a P hat that's way down here, I'll also reject it, okay? Because either way, it fits my, uh, my uh, alternative hypothesis that P is not 0.4. This is where 0.4 would be. And uh, so in, in, the, in the, the examples that we had earlier, I would only reject if it were on the side that my alternative hypothesis is indicating that it's going to be on, okay? But in this case, I'm rejecting it either way. I'm rejecting it if it's just far away from uh, 0.4. Okay? And it means everything is going to be exactly the same as a one-tailed test with the, the uh, difference that the calculation of the p-value is going to be slightly different. Okay? Uh, let's use, uh, well, it says, it tells us to use a significance level of 0.05. Uh, and um, let's check our conditions. Uh, it's a cluster sample. It's a good cluster sample. Uh, it's, uh, we do have independence because I looked... I only looked at five uh, locations throughout the state. There's way more than 50 locations throughout the state. So I'm very uh, uh, convinced that I, I'm not looking at more than 10% of my population. And my sample is big enough because 40% uh, of 184 is 73.6, and 60% of 184, that's n times q, is 110.4, both well over 10. So that means the normal model is appropriate here, and I can go forward. So. Let's uh, look at what going forward means. The expected value of p hat is going to be 0.4. The standard deviation is going to be the square root of p times q divided by n, which gets us 3.61%. And so it's normally distributed with uh, those uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and, um, and so uh, from our sample, we see that p hat is 62 out of 184. That's 33.7%. So it's, it's, it's not 40, but it's not wildly away from 40. Uh, it gives us a z-score of negative 1.7456. Okay? Now, this is where things are different. Because in the past, I would say, well, what's the probability of getting something... Okay, we're on the low end here, right? I'd say, what's the probability of getting something this low or lower? But the fact is, this time I have to say, what's the probability of getting something this low or lower or that high or higher, okay? What's the probability of getting something this far away 
from point four. Well, so that means I have to say probability that the z is less than the z score we got, or that it's greater than the corresponding positive z score. One easy way to do that is just cal calculate the probability that your z would be between these two, basically the white area here, and then just subtract that from one. Another easy way to calculate it is calculate the same way we were doing it before, this tail here, and just double it. Because since the, uh, uh, the normal distribution is a symmetric distribution, this tail is exactly the same size as this tail. So basically, your p-value is going to be twice as big as it would with a uh, one-tailed test. Okay? So what do we find out? We find out, after doing all of our calculations, that the p-value is 0 0.081. Bummer! Because 0 0.081 is greater than 0 0.05, this means I failed to reject, and I don't get to call the guy posting on the internet a dirty, rotten liar. Shoot, I was really looking forward to that. Okay, so, uh, you know, it doesn't turn out the way that I want it to, and so how do I state my conclusion? I say, because there is an 8.1% chance of getting a sample proportion this different, okay, I said different, not this high, not this low, but different, that's uh, two tail speak, due to natural variation, okay, just the fact that you can get different p-hats. I fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to conclude that the actual proportion of drivers passing their test on the first try is different from 40%. Notice, I'm not saying in this conclusion, yeah, okay, I guess you're right, I guess it is 40%. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, what I'm saying is, okay, I didn't get the evidence to show that you're wrong. And then I mutter to myself, I still think you're wrong, but I just didn't get the evidence to show that, okay? That's actually how you conclude. All right, so things to remember from this. Null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Null hypothesis, always stated within equals. Alternative hypothesis is going to be P is less than, or P is greater than, or P is not equal to. These are the two one-tailed tests. This is the two-tailed test, okay? Hypotheses are about parameters, not statistics. Please don't tell me that your null hypothesis is that p hat equals something, okay? Because that doesn't make sense, okay? The alpha, the significance level, is up to you. You're the one who determines what alpha is, okay? It's going to depend on you, your tolerance for risk. It's also going to depend on the situation, okay? Please don't just charge in and start calculating things. Make sure that you're following the rules of the game before you start playing, okay? Check your conditions. And if, it, if your conditions aren't stated, then you have to assume that it's true. But you have to state that you're making that assumption, okay? And I've said this a couple of times, I'm going to say it again. The p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. The p-value is the probability of getting data as extreme as what you've got, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. It is a conditional probability, okay? And finally, never accept the null hypothesis. No, 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 no. You reject the null hypothesis, or you fail to reject the null hypothesis, but you don't accept it, okay? If you reject the null hypothesis, you have evidence of the, of the alternative hypothesis being true. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you failed to show anything. You don't have evidence of anything, okay? All right, now, after you reject the null hypothesis, okay, so you, you say, I reject that, I say that P is not equal to 0.85 or 0.4 or whatever it was, okay? Well, the next question then is, okay then, what is P? That's the next video, okay? That's going to be confidence intervals of sample proportions, and I'll see you then.